Hello? Is this working? No? Is it working now? Oh, maybe it needs to be closer. How about this? Can you still hear me? No? Now? Hello? No? Still need to be closer? Or do I have to talk like to my chest? <laughs> okay, I guess I'll just talk louder. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Elliot. Uh, thanks for coming to this late afternoon talk. Um, my colleague Nitin and I will uh, go over um, some of the near real time work we've been doing uh, with Spark Streaming uh, for recommendations on Netflix. So, we'll start by talking a little bit about recommendations. Um, why we needed to uh, introduce real time, near real time processing uh, to our pipelines. Uh, some of our use cases um, where we've introduced this, um, common infrastructure we've used, and a few scaling challenges that we faced. So, recommendations on Netflix. Um, the goal of recommendations on Netflix is to provide a personalized experience for each and every member. Um, and the goal being, uh, to help members quickly find content that they'd like to watch. And of course, if we don't do this well, uh, we risk uh, losing the member's interest and they might even abandon the service. So in addition to uh, making great recommendations, um, we, the challenge for us is uh, to do it also at scale and also at, in a timely fashion. So. We have over 125 million uh, members now, and they're spread across the globe, across uh, 190 countries. Um, and in terms of data, that translates into over 450 billion unique events a day, um, spread over uh, 700 plus Kafka topics. So we have many uh, pipelines uh, that process this data to make them usable for analysis as well as uh, training. And our typical data pipelines uh, look like this. Um, our data is stored in Hive, which is backed by S3. As you all know, we use AWS heavily. Um, we have batch ETLs, um, usually written in either Spark or Hive, uh, to process this data and write them back out into Hive tables. Uh, table partitioning is usually by day or hour, and we just schedule our jobs using a combination of cron triggers as well as uh, data, availab data availability triggers. Since these pipelines can get pretty complex, um, so one data set can require um, many dependencies on other data sets and so on and so forth, um, and these, uh, these tables are updated daily or hourly, um, it's uh, common or, uh, for the latency of these uh, data sets to be you know, on the order of days. Um, and add in the possibility of some failures in your pipeline, um, and they, that could, number can even increase even further. So um, why do we need to uh, introduce new real-time processing to our uh, pipelines? Um, there's a couple of business reasons. So our catalog is uh, pretty dynamic. So we're constantly adding new titles to the service. Um, and we always want to find the best audience for every title um, as soon as possible. And doing so um, for brand new titles is um, particularly uh, challenging, uh, especially when we have little uh, play, play information about them. We also have a growing member base, of course. Um, so make, we want to make sure um, everybody gets the best recommendations that uh, we can provide. Um, many aspects of our service are uh, time sensitive. Um, for example, uh, content popularity changes. Sometimes uh, these change, of course, in the long term, but also even sometimes within the day. And we want to account for those changes. And of course, member uh, personal interests also evolve. So we want to make sure that um, we can adapt properly. So uh, in terms of uh, processing data, um, we have more and more of it. Um, so in order for us to keep our latencies low, we kind of want to uh, be able to uh, do something with it as soon as we receive it. Um, so moving to near real time kind of makes sense there. 
Also, if we, the more incremental we can make our pipelines um, in the event of failures, um, hopefully we can minimize the amount of data that we have to reprocess. Uh, on the algorithm side, we are seeing a significant increase in the amount of um, multi unbandits usage for recommendations as well. So these algorithms often combine some sort of randomization for uh, data collection, um, which is then used to update your uh, recommendation models. Uh, since we want to minimize the amount of randomization that we need, we want to be able to update these models as soon as possible uh, when this data arrives. Um, so we can uh, provide the best recommendations um, sooner. So now we'll talk uh, a bit about a few use cases we've, uh, in where we've introduced uh, near real-time processing. We'll start with um, some insights uh, or metrics on video, uh, video performance. So like uh, I mentioned before, um, many titles are being added to our service. Um, and a lot of them actually are produced by Netflix. So in many parts of the business, uh, getting an idea of how well the, perform the video is, uh, the title is doing um, is, is important. Um, questions like um, where in the, uh, how are users discovering this title? Um, which parts of the service are recommending this title? Are people searching for this title? Are there certain countries where a title is uh, more, uh, there's more interest in from, uh, more interest in? Um, and actually, we do have many uh, pipelines that provide uh, these metrics um, uh, for, for, for analyzing uh, video performance. Uh, but a lot of them are batch ETLs. So they do take you know, up to uh, two or three days um, before um, we get a read on it, especially around uh, launching titles. So we um, decided to build a more real-time version of these pipelines uh, to provide these insights um, especially around uh, launch time. So this is uh, kind of a simplified view of um, what our processing looks like. It's pretty straightforward. Um, all of our data lands in Kafka. So interesting events like plays and impressions um, all come through Kafka, and we ingest those using Spark streaming. Um, the counts are maintained inside Spark itself. So we uh, aggregate counts by video as well as a number of other attributes uh, before those are written out into Cassandra. And we have a service that reads the data from Cassandra, uh, does some final aggregations on top of, um, of, of that data to power uh, dashboards. In addition to the counts uh, in Spark streaming, we also compute some aggregates um, that will help with performance and also write those to Cassandra. And our service is uh, smart enough to kind of pick those up um, when they're available. So to help with fault tolerance, um, performance, as well as um, enabling different access patterns to this data, we actually write out the data from Spark streaming into S3 as well. So for fault tolerance, um, we, in the, in the event that we need to uh, restart our streaming job for any reason, we can simply take the data from S3 and uh, put it back, load it back into Spark Streaming and resume processing. Uh, for performance, uh, we can actually out of band, so outside of the streaming job itself where uh, latency is less of an issue, um, we can actually compute even more aggregates which are then persisted into Cassandra. And since the same code is being used in Spark Streaming as well as in batch mode, um, and the format, uh, the schema in Cassandra is the same, uh, the service can seamlessly pick those up when they become available. And lastly, um, we have written a Spark client that exposes the S3 data uh, for additional usage, like uh, for analysis and also for uh, training models. So we maintain the Spark, or we maintain the counts in Spark, um, and this allows us to do uh, only writes into Cassandra, which is important for performance, and also uh, we can have idempotent writes. So this means that we have state to manage uh, inside Spark, and we actually have implemented our own uh, custom 
state management uh, operator for doing this, which is heavily based on the uh, map with state uh, operator inside uh, Spark itself. So um, if you use the Scala Collections uh, API uh, for scan left, this should look pretty familiar for you. Um, we have an input D stream which, for which you can provide an initial RDD for, with your state. Um, and you provide a function that uh, combines the state, existing state, with the incoming batch. So what we found is that this has allowed us to um, more easily reuse our code. Um, since our transformation function, here it's shown as f, um, can just be based on RDDs themselves. So whether the RD comes from uh, the D stream or D streams or um, they're loaded in batch mode, it doesn't matter to us. We can just apply that function. Um, we also have a lower level control over state management. So we have access to the entire state RDD so we can have fairly complicated um, policies for you know, TTLing data, filtering out data, and things like that. And there, for use cases that are very similar to map with state, we have implemented on top of this uh, something called scan by key, which um, makes it easy to do things like map with state. And with that, I'll hand it over to Nitin to talk about some recommendations, uh, use cases, as well as uh, common infrastructure. Thank you, Elliot. Um, as Elliot mentioned, uh, let's take a closer look at the near real-time infrastructure required specifically for recommendations. Uh, example one, uh, we use it heavily for billboard recommendations. Uh, for those of you wondering, billboard is basically the top broad row that you see in your Netflix homepage. Um, given that Netflix launches titles uh, more and more these days, and given that we are a global company, uh, it is very imminent that we find the right title for the right person, and most importantly, at the right time. And not only that, we also need to be able to uh, respond to member feedback very quickly. So you do something on the side, you play something, we want to be able to factor in those signals uh, also uh, to our machine learning to make sure that we are recommending the right things for you. Uh, use case two is artwork personalization. So. Um, we publicly spoke about this uh, uh, a few months back in a blog. Uh, I would recommend you to check it out if you haven't already. It's pretty interesting. The first thing is um, not every member has the similar taste when it comes to a title. Um, some members prefer romantic comedy. Some members prefer uh, uh, horror, uh, horror shows. So the genre themselves are different. So one of the things that we want to do is how can we um, show a specific image of a title that relates more to what the member can uh, relate to or what as it basically sets the tone for what the mem member might like. Uh, there are a couple of challenges with this. One is that uh, we, are, we need to be very careful about not deceiving the member about showing them something that the title is not about. And secondly, uh, we have cold start issues. So for example, we have titles, but we don't have historical data for them. So how do we, play, uh, how do we get signals that are more accurate and can be used for machine learning to target these kind of use cases? Um, so before we dive into the exact infrastructure, this kind of gives you a flavor of a very higher level view of what uh, recommendation looks like. Um, so we get data from uh, millions of play-related signals. Uh, they traditionally go to multiple layers of ETL, typically like what uh, Elliot mentioned earlier on. Uh, these ETL layers could take uh, a day or a few days, depending on the dependencies and the depending on the complexities. Uh, and then they go into the training pipelines. Uh, the training pipelines are uh, typically in Spark. Uh, we do the whole uh, feature engineering part uh, and finally generate models. Uh, models are then being uh, consumed by uh, pre-compute or live compute systems uh, before a recommendation is being computed for you. And of course, when it comes to the online side, uh, we want to store these recommendations in like caches or data stores so that you get uh, low latency lookups when the member is visiting. Uh, when it comes to near real time, almost everything in this picture is the same except this part. Um, so typically the play related signals and everything that we get go through Kafka uh, and then we add a streaming layer on top of it uh, to provide near real time data to the training pipelines, uh, which then the rest of the flow is very similar to uh, what I was mentioning in the previous slide. All right, we have talked enough about the infrastructure, so what exactly do we need from the near real-time infrastructure? Um, before I get into that, I want to introduce two terminologies to you. 
Uh, the first one is an impression. Uh, so think of impression as something that has been shown to you. So as a member, if you open the Netflix app and you see rows of videos, think of every single one of them as an impression. And a play, a play is something that when, uh, happens when you start actually playing a title. So uh, ideally, we want to attribute what impressions or what set of metadata in the recommendations led to a play themselves. So uh, not only impressions, but we also will be interested in uh, A-B test specific information. So for example, what test you are in. And uh, given that we leverage uh, some of the explore, exploit, and um, uh, contextual bandits kind of stuff uh, in this online world, we want to be able to understand whether you are in an explore ex uh, um, kind of experience or an exploit kind of experience. So ideally, the near real-time infrastructure will actually join all of this data and then give it um, uh, to the training pipelines. Uh, zooming in a little bit more, end-to-end, um, the, -end, the in uh, attribution infrastructure looks something like this. So from Kafka, we have uh, Spark Streaming, which takes in some of the data from Hive, uh, which I'll get into a, a much more in, in, the, in the coming slides. And then it produces the data to S3. And the handoff between the stream processing and the batch processing layer it takes uh, is from S3. And there is a Spark job uh, that runs, which takes the data from S3 and then writes it back, uh, writes the joint output to S3. Uh, we have a Spark-based uh, client, which, uh, which then uh, can be used by our downstream consumers to read this data from S3 in terms of RDDs or data frames, uh, and in some cases, data sets. Um, Jumping into the stream processing bit, uh, excuse me. Uh, stream processing, uh, we leverage Spark 2.0, and uh, we are using D streams, which means we um, take advantage of uh, the micro batching architecture. Uh, we have billions of events coming in from Kafka every day. Uh, they are then processed as impressions and plays. Let's say, for simplicity, we have two topics, and we process one as impressions and the other as plays. Um, and then we care about only the certain fields and certain attributes that we need from them. We strip them out. And uh, we have a very unique use case of there are some slow moving data or some experimentation data that is actually living in Hive, uh, which we might want to augment the stream with. So uh, since, that it's, since streaming is a little bit more performance sensitive, we need, to be, uh, we need to make sure that this is done in a very performance effective way. So what we do is we have a background thread which queries this information uh, at a certain frequency and then loads it into an in-memory cache. And then this cache is being um, broadcasted from the Spark driver to the executors. So that then the incoming data then can look up the cache based on whatever information it needs. And then this information is tagged and uh, sent to S3. Uh, now the second half of it is uh, the actual join. So the join, in this case, uh, we want to do some kind of windowing because we don't know when an impression for a play or an additional metadata could be available. So we want to have some kind of flexibility in how we want to look back uh, for an impression given a certain play. So uh, one of the advantages of doing this in batch over streaming is that for whatever reason you want to go back uh, a few days and reprocess some of this data uh, with a different windowing mechanism, let's say you want a higher quality of the join, then this architecture allows you uh, that flexibility. Also, when it comes to uh, operations, it's much more easier to, uh, to manage a, a batch processing job in general, as some of you might already know. So, um, where did I leave off? So basically, we had windowed impressions and joins, uh, which are then deduped. Uh, purely because uh, Kafka has at least one, so we need to make sure that our, our downstream processing is uh, idempotent. And then we actually extract a join key from both of these streams, uh, I mean, sorry, from both of these sources, and then the uh, joint output is actually written through S3. And just like the uh, streaming case, we also have additional metadata which uh, we need to augment this data so that the training pipelines can uh, make use of them. Uh, jumping into the common infrastructure, uh, what does our deployment or the Netflix Spark stack look like? Uh, for deployment, uh, traditionally, or for CI, CD, we use Jenkins, which is continuous integration, continuous deployment. Uh, we produce an AMI whenever uh, newer changes to Spark or any of the underlying tools has been available. Uh, our interface to production is through Spinnaker, 
uh, as some of you might know, Netflix is open source Spinnaker. So it allows you to in, uh, interface with any kind of your production systems, all the way from doing releases and rollbacks uh, to changing your auto scaling groups or setting scaling, scaling policies. So pretty much our interface to production is uh, as a Spinnaker. Um, Spinnaker allows you to do a few things. For example, it, it has a hierarchy of how do you organize app, uh, your uh, entire app. So it has applications which then has clusters, and then which, have, which uh, themselves has auto-scaling groups, uh, which is similar to the EC2 auto-scaling group. Now, coming from a Spark standpoint, there are three things that are very key for us. One is runners. So uh, for a streaming job, it's long running, so Marathon fit in very nicely for us. Uh, whereas for batch, uh, we wanted something that would do a much more efficient uh, DAG processing or workflow processing and dependency management. So we use something called Mason which again is a, is a homegrown infrastructure that, uh, uh, that we developed at Netflix uh, uh, using Scala. Uh, the second aspect of uh, Spark specific stuff is resource management. Uh, so since we use Marathon, Mesos was a natural fit because they do play very well. So it's kind of like we have our own internal version of BDAS stack. Uh, so BDAS, for those who don't understand, is like a, a Berkeley data analytics stack. So we run layers of it with Netflix using Spinnaker. Uh, the third aspect is, uh, is storage, which uh, we use S3, as I've mentioned uh, in the previous slides, but we also use HDFS for some temporal data and also for some checkpointing from, uh, from streaming. And uh, we, of course, run this in a, in a multi-region setup, and Spinnaker also allows you to do this in a, uh, multiple availability zones uh, to, so that we can uh, manage the availability SLAs. Um, some of the challenges specific to this infrastructure in multi-region is the concept of geo-routing. So especially given that you're a global company, it's uh, not easy to assume that every single request of yours, independent of your geography, is served from the same data center. So uh, what that could mean for this system is that your impression could come from one uh, data center and your play could be going to another data center. So how, do we, how are we able to join or take care of these kind of scenarios? So we run streaming across all the regions, but the batch pipeline that we talk about uh, is actually run only in one region. Uh, so in that way, the batch job reads the data from all the three regions and then does the join and the deduping. So in which case, uh, these kind of uh, corner cases are also being addressed. And my favorite slide, uh, chaos is something I feel is very specific, uh, special in Netflix. Uh, not really because uh, other companies don't do it, it's just that the way Netflix thinks about chaos is very unique. It's a design principle and we follow it very, very religiously. And we do, um, uh, as some of you might know, we do Chaos Monkey in the past, where which are instance failovers, where uh, we randomly kill off instances and then we try to see if the system is resilient for that. Uh, since then, we have graduated over to uh, Chaos Kong, which is region failovers. So at any point in time, uh, when building this infrastructure, you should, be, um, you should be assuming that not all the regions are operational. At any point in time, one of the regions could be failing. So we need to build the infrastructure to be able to handle these kind of cases too. Um, so uh, right now, we are dealing with this by being over-provisioned in all the regions. But ideally, we want to be more cost effective and performance effective. So uh, we want to, we'll, we're considering options like auto scaling. It's, everything is good always, but <laughs> there, are, there are some times where things don't go right. Uh, because Spark is a distributed system. It could fail uh, for n number of reasons. And usually it has a habit of failing in the middle of the night. I don't really know why. Uh, <laughs> so stream processing could get stuck. Um, uh, your driver could fail. Your uh, uh, storage layer uh, could have n number of issues. There could be underlying uh, issues in the, in, the, in the data center itself. So what we do is um, but typically we try to capture as much metrics as possible, uh, both from the batch job as well as from the streaming job. And then we write it to something called Atlas, which is our metric sync. So Atlas is like, um, think of it as a time series database. Uh, so the open source version of it would be similar to like if you had known of RRD tools plus Graphite and Grafana put together. So that's uh, again a, an open source thing from Netflix. Um, and most importantly, I don't want to get paged at 2 a.m. in the morning, especially when I'm binge watching something. Uh, so these kind of things drove us towards a model of saying uh, we need a first level of defense. So can we try to build something uh, for auto remediation that can reduce the operational overhead on the developers themselves? And we have a version of it running in production already. So let's say your Spark job or your Spark streaming job um, continuously writes metrics. 
Uh, these could be infrastructure metrics, Spark specific metrics that you can find in the Spark UI, or uh, application metrics or business metrics. And when we set alerts on these metrics, we give it a, a nice enough threshold to make sure that there are no false alarms. And then once we have a robust alert, then you can say, hey, if something doesn't look right, just uh, write a metadata to SQS. And uh, we have a polar uh, which reads the SQS and says, you know, something is not right. Let me go ahead and fix the Spark job. Uh, an example of fixing the Spark job could be as simple, of, as, simple as, you know, just restarting it. Uh, but, uh, and then a Spark goes through and starts writing the metrics again once it's up. Uh, an extension of this infrastructure that we have been thinking about is uh, for dealing with scenarios like auto scaling, like I mentioned in the uh, a few few slides before. So technically, the trigger could be something like how far behind are we in terms of processing, and then the auto remediation infrastructure could just go in and then scale up the number of uh, resources we have for Spark and then restart Spark itself. So um, a lot of interesting features can be built on top of it, but this is like the infrastructure layer itself, which uh, which yeah, which you can see. Um, streaming challenges, uh, so anything, any system tuning is not that easy. So specifically with streaming, uh, an application has to be running all the time. So the mentality about how you think about streaming versus batch is completely different. So one thing is a micro batch interval. So how do you tune a micro batch interval? Uh, should it be in the order of seconds, in the order of minutes? What, does it, what exactly is the speed spot? Uh, where you optimize the resources correctly as well as provide the right SLA for your uh, downstream members. Number two is memory tuning. Uh, again, it's, it's never an easy problem, uh, especially given the fact that we have a cache in our streaming um, system. So we have taken heap dumps uh, multiple times, understand how the growth of the, um, how the in-memory cache grows along with the Spark streaming data grows. And also data from Kafka is also constantly growing. So we say, we take the data we understand and uh, we kind of estimate to see how long and what the growth pattern would be for the next uh, you know, few months out. Uh, the third challenge is kind of very interesting is uh, parallelism and shuffle trade-off. So if you don't, uh, one thing which I failed to mention in the, spa, in the, in the, in the streaming infrastructure was uh, before we write the data to S3, we actually repartition it. The reason for that is uh, your Kafka scale might be higher, let's say, and in which case writing the data directly to S3 will just produce too many number of files, which might be okay for you as a writer, but whoever is consuming the data will be having problems with it. So we re try to repartition the data uh, so that for S3 read and write efficiencies are better. Uh, however, the challenge with that is now you're reducing the parallelism because only a number of partitions are active at any point in time. So again, all of this is experimental data. We just have to run multiple tests and come up with empirical evidence as to why one is better than the other. Uh, the second aspect is kind of data quality issues. This is a, a standard battle between streaming and the batch world to see uh, if I had a larger join window, uh, then I could technically have a a uh, higher join quality in between plays and impressions. But if I have a shorter window, then the data is low latency because I can give it to you in a shorter amount of time, but the quality won't be as high. So where exactly is the sweet spot? Do we say, oh, 90% accuracy is fine? Or do we say, oh, 85% uh, is fine? Or where exactly does that lie? It, it, sometimes it varies from consumer to consumer too. So these are some of the typical challenges that we are facing. Uh, that's all we had for now. So there are other Netflix talks. So tomorrow at 11.40, we have two Netflix talks around the same time. Uh, so you can pick whichever one you want. <laughs> so one is uh, fact storage scale for uh, uh, recommendations. The other is a stratification library uh, built on Scala for ML use cases. And thank you very much. That's all we had.